So much of what I have discussed in the advanced training course has been background leading up to the application you've all been waiting for, pollinator gardening. If you still have outstanding quizzes to complete, please do so. The links are all available under lesson materials for each lecture. By the end of this module, you will have an understanding of the best strategies for incorporating bee-friendly plants into landscapes, how to promote bee forage with edible landscaping, and how to incorporate solitary bee habitat in home gardens. Previously, I introduced more than you ever wanted to know about the visual color spectrum for bees. Unlike humans, they can see wavelengths in the ultraviolet part of the color spectrum to yellow-green, but lack the photoreceptors to see red. In the area of their visual spectrum where yellow overlaps with ultraviolet, a color called bee purple is produced, which humans cannot see. Birds see into the red part of the color spectrum, which is why the majority of red and orange flowers are naturally ornithophilous, or bird pollinated. I also described how different species of bees have different mouth parts adapted to feed on various shapes of flowers. Smaller bees, such as sweat bees, have what are classified as short tongues, which means they are best evolved to feed on nectar and pollen from open-faced flowers. This contrasts with other species of bees, such as bumblebees, which have very long tongues and are thus more effective at collecting nectar from flowers with a deeper corolla. Honeybees have an intermediate tongue length, which contributes to their ability to be opportunistic and versatile foragers on a variety of floral shapes. Flowers come in all shapes and sizes, and there are examples of each kind represented among Hawaii's diverse native and naturalized flora. With a medium tongue length and mid-sized body, floral shapes most easily accessed by honeybees would include open disc, bilabiate, bell-shaped, brush blossoms, and composite. Keel-shaped flowers are complex morphologically and difficult to maneuver, though honeybees will visit these flowers if there's an acceptable floral reward. In Hawaii, we only have a single native genus of bees belonging to Hylaeus, also called the yellow-faced bees. The remaining 19 species have been introduced from elsewhere in the world, 18 of which are solitary. Honeybees are the only social bee in the state. However, these introduced species are the ones that will be encountered in home gardens and agricultural areas. So these are the ones that pollinator gardens will attract and sustain. There was, of course, a reason for introducing these concepts early on. Floral color and shape are important considerations when designing a bee-friendly landscape. The most attractive floral colors for bees are white, yellow, and blue or purple. Pollinating flies are also drawn to yellow and white. Keeping in mind that flowers co-evolve with their pollinators, the best pollinator gardens will have a diversity of floral colors and shapes to attract the maximum amount of bee diversity. Honeybees specifically have what is called a high forage fidelity, meaning when they leave the colony to forage, they will only visit one species of flower. So when designing your garden, be sure to include mass plantings of each floral species so honeybees and other pollinators are better able to locate what you've planted. 
as opposed to only one of each plant. This doesn't mean an entire flower bed can only be one plant species. Think of a field of wildflowers. Many plant species are present, but there's a lot of them in one area. Honeybees are therefore able to locate them and have plenty to visit before heading back to the hive. Diversity is important not just for increasing bee diversity, but also for ensuring nutritional diversity of resources. Include as much as you reasonably can in the space you have available. Many common landscaping plants have absolutely no value to pollinators, either because they do not require insect pollination or because they have been bred for showiness at the expense of nectar and floral rewards to be aesthetically pleasing, as opposed to nutritionally appropriate for garden visitors. When choosing specific landscaping plants, double check that bees will actually use them. In the past, I have always encouraged inclusion of regionally native plants and there are a number of native Hawaiian plants that are considered bee friendly. Island specific lists, including alternative uses of these flowering plants are available on my website at cms.ctar.hawaii.edu slash pollinators slash bee plants. But remember that honeybees and all other common garden visitors in Hawaii are not native. It is very likely that honeybees particularly are visiting and pollinating non-native plants. There is nothing wrong with including these in your garden as well, but be sure that you are not planting anything that is weedy in Hawaii or likely to spread readily. Staff at local garden centers are often very knowledgeable and can assist if you have specific questions. Also be sure you understand your local growing conditions and are choosing plants that will thrive in your soil and climatic region. Another important consideration for pollinator gardens is bloom time. Since we live in a state that does not experience a true winter, we have bees flying year round in need of sustenance. Within a single year, you should always strive to have blooming plants available with a new cohort of blooms beginning as the previous one ends. But this doesn't necessarily mean replanting your garden every month. Both annuals and perennials provide pollen and nectar for bees. Annuals are more time consuming to maintain while perennials are easier and larger. A balance of both in your garden creates a reliable resource for the bees and less of a headache for you. Flowering shrubs and trees provide mass bloomings, often for extended periods of time, and can help fill in times when you don't have annuals blooming. Beneficial pollinator habitat doesn't have to just be focused on purposeful landscaping. If you're going for the more natural vibe, Weedy plants that occur in lawns can be left without using herbicide. Often, these are visited by honeybees and in temperate regions provide valuable forage, particularly in the spring. It's all a matter of changing what in our minds is aesthetic for our homes. It doesn't have to just be a green lawn food desert for beneficial insects there can be beauty in unplanned elements as well. Providing flowering resources benefit not only pollinators, but other beneficial insects as well, many of which are predators of pest insects. While predators specialize on prey items, they also need carbohydrate and alternative protein sources from time to time which they seek out in the form of nectar and pollen. All plants with pollen and nectar resources can also be insectary plants, and there is no distinction between insectary plants and pollinator plants. This is just a different way of thinking about which organisms 
benefit from flowering resources within the environment. Common insectary plants that attract natural enemies include dill, cilantro, carrot, fennel, buckwheat, and sun hemp. The natural enemies that will benefit from these resources include surfid or hoverflies, which have a predaceous larval stage and pollinating adult stage, solitary wasps, parasitoid wasps, lacewings, minute pirate bugs, and lady beetles. Given the floral morphology of these plants, these are most likely to benefit introduced bees with short tongues as well, in addition to honeybees. Providing flowering resources does not necessarily mean that you will immediately see an increase in pollinators or other beneficial insects, particularly if your neighbors and others in your neighborhood aren't also providing pollinator habitat. This is because wildlife need a continuum of resources available in order to move into new areas. These can be defined as ecological corridors or habitat connecting wildlife populations that have been otherwise separated by human activities or structures. Take for example, this neighborhood street. You can tell from an aerial view that most people have opted for pristine green lawns and have very little insect-friendly landscaping. But what you don't see is that this neighborhood has a park to the right and a park to the left, which have pollinator populations. If everyone on this street planted pollinator gardens, then this would create a corridor by which pollinators from both parks could mingle. The Million Pollinator Garden Challenge has reached its goal of registering over 1 million pollinator gardens throughout the United States, but consider registering your epic effort and encouraging your neighbors to do the same. The statistic goes that one in every three bites of food we consume is dependent upon pollinators. Interestingly, there is nothing in the scientific literature to support this number, though it is widely quoted. I would hazard a guess that it's actually much greater than this, given that livestock are fed hay and alfalfa, which both depend upon pollination to an extent, at least for seed production. Anyway, what's important to remember is that when bees pollinate a flower, this is a mutual relationship. The plant gets pollinated and can reproduce, while the pollinator walks away with nourishment. So when you see a bee visiting a cucumber flower in your garden, both you and the bee are engaging in a win-win interaction. One of Michelle Obama's signature causes was nutrition, and she started the Feds Feed Families Initiative, where federal employees would donate time and resources to plant gardens and donate all the produce to local food pantries, which often have fresh food shortages. In 2014, our 40 by 90 foot garden in Brookings, South Dakota, produced over 2,100 pounds of produce, nearly all of which depended upon insect pollination. A small family farm large backyard garden planted to supplement incomes, and even a small vegetable garden have the potential to feed not only you and your neighbors, but the bees as well. A number of crops can be grown in home gardens that depend upon pollination, and you can incorporate these into your garden as shade plants or plant a vegetable garden. Various herbs are easy to grow, and though we tend to only want the greens, if you let them bolt, the bees will find them and provide you with the opportunity to save the seeds and replant. The same goes for lettuces, radish, broccoli, carrots, onions, and cabbage. Cucurbits are another group of crop plants, including various melons, squash, and cucumbers that depend upon honeybee pollination. 
Check your variety, however, because parthenocarpic types do not need pollination, and if they are pollinated, will result in misshapen fruits. You would typically only grow parthenocarpic varieties in protected structures where honeybees do not have access. For shade trees in your yard, mango and avocado are prolific choices. While the flowers are largely visited by pollinating flies, honeybees will also take advantage of the blooms. Whenever possible, plant heirloom varieties as these have not been bred for mass commercialization and still have quality nectar and pollen rewards. However, improved varieties are often pest resistant, which means you use less pesticide in your garden. It's a balancing act and make choices based on your own situation. Incorporating insectary plants into your edible landscape will further boost natural enemy populations and contribute to biocontrol efforts in your garden. Unfortunately, providing floral resources for food isn't enough if you are wanting to attract and maintain solitary bees to your garden or farm. Recall that with the exception of honeybees, all other bees in Hawaii have solitary lifestyles. This means that as opposed to living in a colony and working as a group, individual females are responsible for reproducing, locating a nest, and provisioning her young. In their natural habitat, females seek out hollow stems as a nest for their young. She can also take advantage of discarded dry bamboo, holes drilled into old wood, and paper straws as nesting habitat. The females line the nests with various plant substrates or oral secretions, provision the cell with pollen, and lay an egg. She does this until the entire nest is full. The distance that these bees travel from their nest depends on their size, but is not much more than a few hundred meters. This is why both forage and nesting habitat are essential for boosting local solitary bee populations. While the male and female colonizers to your garden are visiting your flowers, the next generation is developing in the nests. Artificial nest structures will be most effective in Hawaii in areas at lower elevations. Because so many of our solitary bees are introduced from elsewhere in the Pacific, they do not survive as well at higher elevations. And because so much of urbanized areas lack valuable pollinator forage, it may take time for the bees to find your habitat. Keep persisting and encourage your neighbors to create habitat as well, to start creating ecological corridors for the bees to move throughout your neighborhood. There is a whole range of nesting structures you can use that will be taken advantage of by solitary bees. They can range from a luxury bee resort that becomes an upcycled focal point of your garden to a little Motel 6. The next time tree branches come down in a storm, drill holes in these and leave them as a stack in a corner of your yard for the bees. Bamboo can be bundled together with a string and hung from a tree. These are great projects for little hands too. Keiki love decorating bee hotels as backyard art. As an activity, this can start broader conversations about the importance of pollinators, conservation, and malama aina. In order to receive credit for the advanced certification, please complete quiz 10 found under lesson materials. The final lecture of this advanced pollinators module for the master gardeners will be presented by Dr. Will Haynes and will cover the identification and biology of Hawaii's native butterflies, as well as host plant considerations for encouraging their presence around your home.